Good morning, welcome back to the Junie Smallpea channel. Just when you think you've seen everything. Well, here we go. We got an article titled, Gold is the Worst Investment in History. So buckle yourselves in. If you're a fragile gold investor, gold hawk, I don't like to use the term gold bug as you know, but if you got sensitive feelings, uh, buckle up, or you, you, know, you might want to just not watch the video. But uh, believe me, it's not as bad as it sounds, so join me in this conversation and go ahead and throw some comments below. And hey, when you're done with this video, maybe you can go talk to this individual and uh, give him a nice, polite, using intelligence and articulate words, and uh, maybe small words for this guy. You might even need to break out a crayon and draw a picture. But uh, his name is Brian Lund, found this article, and uh, we're going to go through it together here as we do on the Junius Malpe channel and just discuss it. Because that's what it's all about. Um, we'll just go right with the title. We'll start there. Um, first off, gold for most of us, as we can think about it, is typically not an investment. Uh, it, it really shouldn't be. And we've said that on this channel millions and times before. And a lot of people have reiterated that fact regarding the mindset in purchasing gold. It's, um, it's a hedge. It's a place to put gold to hold value. And we'll talk about that as we move on here. So here he says he doesn't want to be the bearer of bad news. Um, but this is this is great. Uh, you read through this little snippet here. Go ahead and do that for me. Um, he's, he's obviously sensitive to all of us as he says that. But he leaves a link for an article that we're going to get to at the end of this video as well. Titled, Gold Will Eventually Be Worthless. So... Stay, stay and by for the end of this video where we talk about that article as well. But uh, he goes, in addition to the miserable historical performance, gold has had many other failings as an investment, not, a, not least of which are the cumbersome and inefficient options available to own it and the prevalence of less than reputable salespeople in the precious metal space. Stop. Let's keep this here. We're going to take this apart a little bit. Cumbersome and inefficient options available to own it. Um, I am assuming he's talking about the laws and the abilities of consumers, uh, investors, people like you and me, to transact, buy, and sell it. That's not the fault of gold. Gold doesn't pass legislation. Gold doesn't fabricate um, or uh, make laws. Gold doesn't... Uh, make any rules in which we have to live by, those are made by man, by government. Anything cumbersome and inefficient regarding the transactions of gold, tax structure, tax laws, as you all know, it is cumbersome at times, um, those are created by governments that hate gold. And that goes back to the article we've reviewed and read on this channel. If you go back and look, The Federal War on Gold. I'd encourage you to read it if you haven't done so already. But the point is, Gold doesn't create the cumbersome and inefficient options available to own it. Uh, governments do because they hate it for reasons we've discussed here. This guy obviously doesn't get the, um, the fiat empire mindset of why gold is a threat to the state and to totalitarian regimes throughout history. But uh, let's continue on. Less than reputable salespeople in the precious metal space. That's a huge hurling insult towards people who deal in precious metals, and I've known quite a few, and many of them are very reputable. And I'm not going to use such a broad brush to paint the entire industry as he just did, saying that less they're all less than reputable salespeople, somehow as if gold and silver attracts the dregs of society. No, I'm going to use one word, one name, one name here, ladies and gentlemen, Bernie Madoff, the guy that, one of the main architects for the NASDAQ, was he a reputable salesperson? Would you say he was a reputable person to leave your money with? Hmm? Look at the list, the laundry list, the resume, the track record of Wall Street and the stock market, and the number of Ponzi schemes that have been dealt out where people's wealth went missing, completely disappeared. So I think less than reputable salespeople are everywhere. You can go to any used car lot. No offense to used car salesmen. You guys have an honorable trade, most of you. But you can go to any used car sales uh, lot in this country and perhaps find a less than reputable salesperson. 
they're in every industry. They're in every facet of civilization. So please don't just say that gold and only people that sell gold are horrible. I think that was a uh, an interesting little piece uh, that he put into the article. Here's one. Owning physical gold in the form of bullion has many drawbacks. Why bid and ask prices on physical gold ensure that the moment you purchase it, you are already underwater on your investment. In addition, shipping costs for the heavy metal will further add to your cost basis. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Uh, the wide bid and ask prices. Leaving you underwater. Have any of you purchased mutual funds? Because I have. Have any of you tried to invest in um, different uh, investment companies where you're having to pay percentage rates um, on the on that investment vehicle, that, that mutual fund every year, like the maintenance costs, it might be 1.3% uh, per year on the funds that are in there that you have to pay for them to manage it. Also, there's usually a 5% to 7% right off the top. So for, um, you know, for every $100, you're talking about $5 or $7 that you have to pay to the mutual fund company in order to invest money in that fund. So let me, we're going to stop right there. Just as in with gold and silver having to pay over the spot price because no one's going to sell you gold for what it costs to get it out of the ground. There's the assay costs, the signiary costs, the striking of coins, the purification of the metal. So management of mutual funds and stocks also requires a bit of human labor and effort requiring you, the investor, to pay more than that particular investment vehicle, we'll just use that term, is worth. I was looking just the other day, now don't don't get scared everybody, I still stack, I'm still a stacker, but I was talking to a friend who's actually a financial advisor, and we were, as friends, and I was looking at some information he had on some commodity backed mutual funds, based because I was looking at the oil prices, and uh, the one I was looking at was 5.35% I believe, uh, immediately, so every time I put money in there, um, if I put a buck in, they would take 5.3 cents out right off the top. And then also it was a 1.35% yearly maintenance cost. So if I had a thousand bucks in there, uh, what is that? Like a, like 135 bucks or something. Um, it was, it was significant. There was a lot of money, uh, tied up in the maintenance costs and the purchasing of these mutual funds. So my point here is, you can end up underwater in a mutual fund just with your mutual, your these costs, these uh, the maintenance costs and the handling fees and and so on. So, okay, now let's get to it. So my point is, every investment vehicle has those costs. That's not isolated to just gold. The guy's a fool for even bringing that up. Um, and as a matter of fact, a lot of times gold and silver, if you shop around properly, your maintenance costs and because you only have to do it the one time over spot will end up in the long term being far less than money you would put into a, a specific mutual fund. Let's look at his shipping costs for heavy metal. I know places that ship that stuff for free. Um, very low costs. As a matter of fact, if you buy it locally, there is no shipping costs. And I have a video on that, on the reason I like to purchase gold and silver as locally or as close to me as possible. Anyone out there watching this video has the ability to look around them and find a place to buy really good gold bullion and silver bullion within a hundred miles easily. So go for a drive, go on a weekend, go, whatever, but you can find it. That's the point. Um, and regarding shipping costs for these heavy metals, I love how he uses heavy on there. How, how many tons does he think people buy? I, I don't know very many people who, who could even take delivery or order a 420 ounce London good delivery bar. It's not going to happen. Uh, you're talking about an ounce, uh, two ounces, or a, a couple of British sovereigns. <laughs> so basically less than the shipping weight on a book, <laughs> you know, or a couple of spare parts for your laundry machine that broke down. So it's going to be extremely, the, the weight is, nobody orders gold or silver by the ton, unless of course you're a central bank. Okay, don't look to the stock market for help. Not going to go into this too much detail, but he's actually he's actually hit the nail on point with this one. He's on point. He uh, he basically tells you that there's no way to prove that any of these gold-backed funds have any gold. Um, 
you know, the, the ETF shares of physical gold. So basically, in a long story short, he's telling us that paper gold's not a good idea because they might not have it. Uh, so don't buy paper gold, and it's not required to be insured. It, it, his points for not buying paper gold are kind of the same ones that you and I share. So that's great. He reiterates those points. Paper gold, don't buy it. We'll skip on. Move on. Uh, it won't protect you in the worst case scenario. So this is interesting because he's talking about how if things really got bad, the government would just seize and take your gold anyway, like they did back in 1933. And I think that's interesting because this is America, you know, the land of the free, and yet we're the only country that ever really did something this drastic and, and in this magnitude like this that's pretty famous when it came to the, the gold confiscation acts under Roosevelt. And we've talked about that at length here on the channel um, and I don't think it's a I don't really think that it's a relevant fear I really don't because I don't think the government would ever try to do that again uh, I think people learned their lesson the first time we've covered this so I'm not going to go into too much more detail on it but it just won't it just I don't think it's going to happen I don't think it's a plausible idea it was one of the lowest complied with laws ever uh, very low compliance rate nationally and you can look at the evidence of that by just the number of pre-1933 gold coins that still exist and were not turned in and melted down into bars and sold to Europe and other nations. So, um, yes, uh, don't worry about that not protecting the worst case scenario because the evidence points to the opposite of that. All you have to do is look at hyperinflation scenarios historically. You can look at what happened in Weimar, Germany. And there's dozens, if not hundreds of cases that you can hear evidence of where witnesses and families have come forward and re re recounted incidences where their gold protected them or having gold protected them or how they made incredible investment decisions during that time period by owning gold and trading it for pieces of real estate or property or businesses uh, or goods and services. So. That's uh, just not the case. As, as a matter of fact, even up recently, when you look at the uh, hyperinflation in Africa, um, the Zimbabwe, they were there were people there panning for gold so that they could buy bread. Uh, even in India, there's people that pan the dirt outside of jewelry stores for gold dust in order to buy that falls off of the jeweler's clothes in order to buy goods and services. So in these poor countries, people are still transacting in gold because it, it you know it holds value. Uh, so, and one other point to add to that is, um, he says the point of having gold to protect against a cat catastrophic event, what, what's the point if the government can just seize it? Well, why would a government seize something that you're arguing is absolutely worthless and we shouldn't own it to begin with because it's so worthless? Why would a government want to seize it? I thought the government was the all-knowing, you know, beneficiary of all things, all great, all goodness comes and emanates from the state. So if they're being in all their wisdom coming to steal our gold, why would they steal it if it's not worth anything? They should they themselves should know in all their mighty wisdom how worthless the metal really is. Okay, enter the modern world. Ultimately, this is one of the best. Um, gold is a legacy investment vehicle from a time before mass communications, ease of global travel, and the internet. Talk about uh, some kind of a, I don't know, the arrogance and the pride of the modern man. He thinks that we've oh, we've just we've surpassed gold. We we've made it. We are the greatest. We are the apex of all human existence. We have become so enlightened. We no longer need this metal. It's uh, he just this is reeks of arrogance. It, he's he di I mean, basically he's discounting seventy centuries of human existence in economic theory and history, and. Uh, arguing in the face of professors of economics. Um, it's no longer a default store of value that it once was, and financial and technological advances have made it an investment best suited for collectors and hobbyists. Collectors and hobbyists. So you mean to tell me the New York Federal Reserve, the European Union, the central banks of Russia, China, India, Saudi Arabia, Belgium, the Netherlands, the list goes on. All of those central banks, all of those nations' economic advisors, 
all of those heads of state fall into the category of collectors and hobbyists. Let that sink in for just a moment because it's not for serious investors, he just told you. I think that's, um, that's a pretty outlandish statement and I haven't seen too many uh, statements regarding gold uh, like that. Uh, one other point here, and I, I don't think I put the clip in, I'm going to have to go back and get it for you, but uh, at one point he talks about how how many st the stocks and T-bills and bonds and what they performed like over a significant span of time, approximately 214 years or so, 200 years, and a, basically a dollar invested in gold uh, back then is a, is worth about a dollar 96 today, so it doubled in value. Well, good, because my goal was to just maintain my dollar. So you mean to tell me it doubled when all I wanted it to do was be worth the same, the purchasing power, because that's what gold is, as we've talked about. It's a hedge. So it outperformed even my expectations. And he's comparing it to other, as again, investments. Um, but the point is here, gold did not go to zero, sir. It never went to zero, like many paper currencies in the same 214 year span that you just talked about. Paper currencies that were engineered by governments and the state and man and statists. Many paper currencies were born and died in that time frame and went to absolutely zero. Many stocks, T-bills and bonds also went to zero. And you're basing your yields on the best case scenario of an investor, buying the right stocks and selling them at the right times. There's a lot of people that lost their shorts, buddy. They lost everything because of those stocks, those T-bills and those bonds. And many of them were ripped off by unscrupulous and scandalous investing advisors and people that were just shysters on Wall Street. So, how many stocks and T-bills and bonds have gone to zero? How many people have lost everything because of the, the stock market? You know, you look at, back at the times, have we forgotten in 2008 when some of those big banks that were worth so much money, such as Citibank, and all those automotive companies and all those major investment firms and their shares were worth literally less than a dollar. There were shares that were a dollar or less. They almost went to zero. Had the, you know, of course they say, had the government not intervened. And some would argue that those companies are still worth zero. It's just it's like Bitcoin. People are just still investing and buying in it. Yeah, we're not going to go down that road. But my point is, gold's never gone to zero never will and this individual thinking he is the the Voltaire of his day is telling us that gold will eventually be almost worthless so buckle up we're going into his next article that we talked about now this is awesome so the he's talking about how 90 percent of the gold each year he says goes towards jewelry or investments well why is it going towards investments he doesn't tell you which is going towards which, you know, how much is in jewelry, how much is in events. There's a lot going into investments for a reason, reasons that you and I share. But 10% uh, going to industrial use, circuitry, circuit boards. As we all know, it's one of the best metals in the world for that. So um, he says, this is great. That means that almost all the demand is based on the archaic idea of gold as a universal store of value. So it's an archaic idea all of you out there on the Junius Malpe channel you guys you need to just cancel your subscription I'm gonna shut the channel down uh, delete the videos and we just need to all just we need to erase this archaic idea that's entrenched in our minds I mean we're we're cavemen you and I are the equivalent of people who still light their fires with a flint and stone to cook their mastodon steaks with um, I don't know when the last time you had a mastodon steak, but that's basically, I guess, the equivalent of believing gold is a store of value, according to this gentleman. Um, every day, the internet and the free flow of data undermine the concept. I This, again, absolute faith and credit just poured into the modern era, the modern man, and the internet.
Incredible. It's no longer necessary to store value in an inefficient, it's inefficient gold, and for practical purposes, a non-portable format like gold. Non-portable format. So just because I can't wire it to you across the planet, I don't like to wire. I've never, when was the last time you wired money to somebody in Bangladesh? I don't find myself needing to do that. And as a matter of fact, money orders have been doing that for quite some, there are other means, buddy. You don't have to have the internet to send somebody money. Western Union, money, lots of different options out there. But according to this individual, the internet is the almighty. So a non-portable format like gold, it's so non-portable. Uh, it reminds me of the time I read the article by an economist who escaped his Soviet bloc nation with small gold coins that were sewn into his garments and uh, carried all his wealth with him. Portable. Interesting. So it's restricted by borders and a small lightweight piece of plastic can reveal the value owned in the form of currency anywhere. There's an internet or even a good phone connection eliminating gold's usefulness. Oh yes, uh, so much there, so much there ladies and gentlemen. The internet in its current form is barely 10 years old and has yet to truly reach the masses. When it does, we've seen the speed at which technology changes habits and allows people to let go of closely held beliefs. It'll be no different with gold. Someday, you'll see those gold coins, jewelry, and bars. In the same way, now you look at a set of bound encyclopedias, a Beanie Baby, or a Blackberry. Something you once would have paid a lot to own, but that's now an obsolete anachronism. Valuable only for its attractiveness and nostalgic value. In other words, not very valuable at all. I, I, I speechless, really. I mean, Beanie Babies, <laughs> Bound Encyclopedias, Blackberries, all three things that were mass produced by mankind, man, not Mother Nature, not a, not a resource, not a finite element that's in limited quantity that's been valuable for 70 centuries. I, I don't remember the last time an archaeologist encountered a hoard of beanie babies underneath the roads of ancient Rome or in the bogs of Ireland. Uh, I don't remember the last time they found a hoard of blackberries um, that someone had stowed away in a secret vault that they invested in a hundred different tons of blackberries back in the 90s. But the point is, ladies and gentlemen, I wonderful and esteemed and wise viewers of the Junius Walby channel. Sometimes you just can't argue with people. I think I'm at, at the closing of this article um, and at the closing of this video, I think trying to logically explain to this gentleman, no offense to him, I mean he, he does write well, he uses a lot of good words, big words, but to try to explain to our friend here Brian Lund the value of gold, its historical and intrinsic value and its role in economics and mankind's path of transacting in goods and services and, and trading and bartering and currencies and just in order, oh this is so hard to even get the words out for this, but uh, it would be, to try to explain this logically to Brian I think would be the equivalent of trying to smell the color nine so, we'll just close with that. Sorry you feel that way, Brian. Good luck with your internet. Um, good luck with all of your great investments, all of your paper, your little electronic bits of bits, and your little cryptocurrencies. I hope you have fun with them. And um, I'll see you on the other side, buddy. Have a good one.